Father God, we come into your presence this morning asking to know you more. Send your spirit to be with us, to guide our minds and our hearts, to conform us to the image of your Son that the sacrifice of our praise would be acceptable to you. Thank you for your love, we pray through Christ our Lord. Amen. Please remain standing as we sing our opening hymn, uh, whatever is printed in your bulletin.
welcome to all of you today. Thank you for coming to worship at Vallejo Drive. On the right end of the bulletin, you'll see many announcements that pertain to our church life. Take note of each one. We just want to welcome or invite you to come tonight for game night at 7 o'clock upstairs in the fellowship hall. It'll be an opportunity to fellowship together and get to know each other better. Well, tomorrow's a special day. What is it, kids? Oh, come on, now, tell me, what's tomorrow? Father's Day. Do we have any fathers here today? Okay, all dads, to your feet. Come on, stand up, guys. I know it's not easy. We want to tell you thank you for being such great dads. And yeah, let's give them a hand. Come on up, folks, let's give them a their gift. Young people, please remain standing. Our young people have a gift for you. God bless you, and thank you for being fathers in our community. Being a father is a hard job, and so we'll make sure that our fathers are honored today. Good morning, Vallejo Drive. I want to draw your attention to one of the announcements on the right-hand side of the bulletin that Pastor Papendick was directing you towards. The very bottom of that right hand side is an announcement from Communitas, a nonprofit organization here in Glendale that was started by Pastor Todd Leonard over at Glendale City Church. And Communitas is sponsoring here at Vallejo Drive, starting this coming Thursday evening, a very unique workshop on personal finance. And when I say unique, it's unique in the sense that the focus and the core of this four-part workshop will be about honest conversations about our relationship with money. French philosopher Albert Camus said, life is the sum of all of our choices. And believe me, every day when we wake up, we have so many choices to make. Choices as parents, choices as professionals, as co-workers, choices as followers of Christ, choices as community members in our neighborhoods. And we also have so many choices to make when it comes to our financial life. How can we put together our best life? And part of those decisions is dealing with money. Sometimes it feels like there's never enough. Sometimes it's difficult to communicate about money, maybe with a spouse, with family members, with friends. And maybe you feel stressed. Maybe there's an anxiety when it comes to thinking about money, when it comes to dealing with money. So in this unique workshop, we're gonna be talking about our relationship with money something that's not really communicated. And if you think about it, nobody really taught us how to talk about money openly and how to deal with those decisions surrounding our money. How do we make good decisions about money? How does our fears, how does happiness, how does our commitments influence the way we make choices and decisions about money? So, I would really encourage you to come out and have these sorts of discussions. Yes, we'll be talking about tips and hints to better manage your money and so on. But I think the more we have an open dialogue 
about how we use our money, how we think about our money, I think it'll be easier to make better decisions going forward about building that best life for ourselves. 7 p.m. starting this coming Thursday, June 22nd, running for four weeks every Thursday, 7 p.m. in the fellowship hall. Please invite a friend, and I look forward to seeing you there.
and they are collaborating all the time and practicing in their homes and their cars sometimes. <laughs> Thank you so much. And we want to invite every kid in the church. You can come after church. Uh, we are practicing. Um, in August, we will resume the choir. If you need more information, you can contact me or contact the church office. And thank you so much, and please, a big applause to this team. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Sorry, now is the time for our children's story. So any kids that aren't already up here, you can feel free to come forward. And uh, as they do so, uh, the rest of us can say hi to our neighbor. about inviting. Do you know what invite means? Okay, let's see some answers. Inviting. What is inviting? Oh, the microphone, right? There. Inviting means letting people come to something. Okay. Telling them they can come. Uh-huh. Okay. Alija. Inviting means somebody's invited to a birthday or a show. Okay, inviting somebody to a birthday or a show. So, inviting might be like when you get invited to a birthday party or you get invited to something else. Like, it means you, uh, they, they want you to come to something. Ah, I like your word. They like you to come to something, right? Anybody who said, uh, uh, you were gonna say, you were gonna say something? Yes. Invited means that people are going to find your house because they, they, um, they want to go. I see. Thank you so much. I have one more answer. Thank you so much for taking the time to say what is inviting. An eagle rocks. You have to listen. Wow! <laughs> Thank you so much. Well, guess what? I'm going to invite you to my tent. Ooh! Let me see. Ooh! Boop. And it became a tent. And I'm going to come inside my tent. 
just like the times before. Let's say I'm gonna go in. I'm gonna invite. Come, uh, anybody who wants to come, please come. Thank you. Oh, and I'm gonna offer you water. Some water here. I have some water for you. Make it, make it your home. Make it your home. And I have another one right here. Come, come underneath this one. There, underneath this one. <laughs> okay. How nice. How does that? How, how does that feel inside? Telling their stories. Telling their stories, which means they become friends, right? They are becoming friends right here. <laughs> Wouldn't you like to be invited for a play date? Yes! Well, I'm going to knock their door and see if they open. Knock, knock, knock. Knock, knock, knock. May I, may I ask you to come and see me for a minute? Thank you. Come and see me. Come. <laughs> like little worm is coming. Well, how, how did you like all the people that were in, in that beautiful tent? How did you like it? Besides being squishy a little bit, of course, but did you have a friendship going on? Yes, but no. No? Okay, let me see what, what do you say, why not? Let me get back to this because I'd love to hear what was a little bit difficult to talk about the friendship going on there. They get squished. Okay. We did the same, the same thing? Yes. Yes, yeah, squished, squished. And you? I sense that it's fun telling stories of what happened to you when you're squished. I see. Squished. <laughs> <laughs> squished. And you tell you? Meow, right? <laughs> well, yes. When I was in there, it was like big, it was a squished burrito. <laughs> like a squished burrito. And you? Is you guys squished? What happened? Okay. Well, guess what? Okay, tell me one. I feel like being a squished human pancake. Okay, now let me tell you something. Okay. That. That's right. Okay, so being squished, I like that version of being squished. So when I'm being squished, sometimes I may feel a little uncomfortable, right? So that does fit like that when somebody comes to your house and you feel a little bit uncomfortable. That's a strange person. It's coming to my own territory. Uh, I may not want to let them in. I'm not sure if I will let her in. But you see, once we find the good thing of the squishing, like a burrito, somebody said, the burrito is delicious. Who can agree that the burrito is delicious? It's really yummy. What happens if I just put the cheese, a little melted, aside of the burrito? Then does it become delicious in the burrito? Then it doesn't become delicious anymore. Yes. That's right. It becomes wet and squishy and weird, right? But if we see in a good way, the burrito can actually be very good when we put a nice care. So when I'm inviting you to your to my home, I'll offer you water, I'll offer you some of my toys. And you know, the best, one, the, the best ones in teaching us that is you guys. You are the best welcoming people ever. So I want to remind you of the beautiful story in the Bible that talks about that, which is Sarah. Remember when the guys came to visit Abraham? And 
Abraham came out and they said, Oh, please come, sit, have some bread. Would you like some bread? And they said, Oh, Sarah, please can you make and some dough with bread and, and can you come and give all these people to eat? Doesn't that feel nice? How does that make you feel? Does it make you feel welcome? Yes. So we can remind ourselves, in the Bible we have all these beautiful stories that can teach us that God is telling us to go and give. With that in mind, I thank you so much for participating. And now, I ask you, there's not going to be a children's worship, as I think, so I ask you kindly to come and listen to our story in the sermon. Thank you, kids, and remember, go and give. Amen. I would like to invite the deacons to come for the offering. And at the same time, I will read Malachi 3.10. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, that there are many food in, in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and I will see if I will not throw open the food, food, food gates in heaven and pour out so much blessing that you will not have room enough for it. Let us pray. Dear Father, bless all our brothers and sisters and bless the tithes and offerings to help us continue preaching the gospel in this world before you are coming. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
fires coming down, we invite anybody with any concerns they, they need to bring to the Lord to come on up to the front, or any joys that they bring to the Lord to come on up to the front as we sing our prayer song, hymn number 671. Please stand as we read scripture together. I'll read the uh, leader part and you will read the congregation with me. Then Jesus summoned his twelve disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to cure every disease and every sickness. These twelve Jesus sent out with the following instructions. Go nowhere among the Gentiles and enter no town of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. As you go, proclaim the good news. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Cure the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons. You receive without payment, give without payment. Take no gold or silver or copper in your belts, no bag for your journey, or two tunics or sandals or a staff, for laborers deserve their food. Whatever town or village you enter, find out who is in it is worthy and stay there until you leave. As you enter the house, greet it. If the house is worthy, let your peace come upon it. But if it is not worthy, let your peace return to you. If anyone will not welcome you or listen to your words, shake off the dust from your feet as you leave the house or town. Truly, I tell you, it will be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah on the day of judgment than for that town.
thank you, everyone who uh, helped out. Thank you especially to the children's choir and our wonderful choir here, as always. Uh, did you guys hear water running during the prayer? Okay, yeah, yeah. Uh, just to put you at ease, the baptistry, uh, we're going to have to, uh, yeah, the, the baptistry starts running water sometimes by itself. Uh, the Spirit's doing something, I don't know. Um, you know, sometimes I say hi to my mom. You guys know that, who watches at home. Uh, well, my mom's here today, so we get to say hi to her in person, so hi, mom. Uh, uh, let's see. Oh, yeah, I was also going to point out uh, how embarrassing it is that no one sits in the front. I decided that next week I'm going to preach from the back, and then you'll all sit up here. Uh, yeah. Well, last week... You remember we talked about the Great Commission, uh, Jesus' command to go. Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. Jesus sends out his apostles with this mission to carry the good news of God's victory to the whole world. But I think... Even though we talked about those two components, maybe this Great Commission is a little light on detail. We might think to ourselves uh, that the instruction is a little bit thin. Jesus is telling the disciples to go, uh, but what exactly does that look like? You know, the two instructions we discussed last week were baptizing, which means, remember, welcoming people into the family of God. That's why we baptize people in the triune name of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, because in baptism we receive the Holy Spirit so that we are joined to become members of the Son so that we too can call God our Father, right? So in baptism we welcome people into the family of God, and as adopted members of God's family, we are then instructed in the ways of the family. A great lesson there about uh, how we teach people, how we instruct people. Paul says you are no longer slaves, but children. So we obey, but we obey not as servants, but we obey as children. We obey out of love. So as children, we are taught to obey what the Father has commanded, which is what? The Bible says that the whole law, everything, every commandment is summed up in one commandment. I know Jesus famously uh, sums it up in two, right? To love God and love your neighbor. Paul pushes it one step further, and the Apostle John does as well. If you were to summarize the law of God in one commandment, what would it be? To love your neighbor. Because within the love of neighbor is contained the love of God. John says, if you, if you say that you love God, but you don't love your brother or sister, then you're a liar. Right? But even the people who love their neighbor, Jesus comes and says to them, you did this for me even though they do it unknowingly. So the law of God is to love our neighbor. So this purpose of the mission is to go out and to welcome people into the family of God, to expand the boundaries of his family, and to spread the message of his love. And again, that's all well and good, but we may be asking, or we need to be asking, the further question of how. What does this look like? How do we take people from all different cultures, all different backgrounds, different classes, different opinions, different perspectives? How do we take all these different types of people and make them into one family? At the end of Matthew's Gospel, in the Great Commission, Jesus doesn't say how to do that. But I think that's because he already did. You see, the Great Commission at the end of the Gospel is not the first time that these disciples had been sent out on mission. He had already trained them, and that's what we read today in our Gospel reading in Matthew chapter 10. So, let's rewind the tape and go back, actually beginning in Matthew chapter 9, verse 35, the Bible says, Then Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, and curing every disease and every sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them, because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. You see, the ministry of Jesus is rooted in compassion. 
The ministry of Jesus is grounded in meeting the needs of others. He went around curing every disease, every sickness. And why? Because he had compassion. He was not doing good. This is very important to be clear. He was not doing good with ulterior motives. He was not doing good in order to sneak in his theological agenda. Jesus is not pulling a bait and switch of, I will heal you of your disease if you come to my seminar. You know what I'm talking about, right? No, because with Jesus, these acts of love and service are themselves a part of the message. Taking care of people, loving people, is an end in itself, not a means to an end. Does that make sense? Loving people, taking care of people, serving people, sometimes we get it mixed up, we think that we do that so that we can evangelize. But for Jesus, these acts of love and service are evangelism in and of themselves. Let's read it again. The Bible says, Jesus went about all the cities and villages proclaiming the good news of the kingdom. The message of Jesus was good news, news that the kingdom of God had come near. Now someone might then ask him, when he proclaims that, that simple message that is echoed in all of the Gospels, Jesus comes proclaiming the kingdom of God is at hand. And someone could say, well what does that mean? What is the kingdom of God? What does it mean that the kingdom of God has come near? And what's Jesus' answer to that question but his actions, right? What does it mean that the kingdom of God has come near, but that the sick are cured, and the dead are raised, and the demons are cast out, and the lepers are cleansed? Because the kingdom of God is precisely this kingdom of love and service. The kingdom of God is that place where God's will is done on earth as it is in heaven. So you see how service and evangelism for Jesus are not two different things. Service and evangelism are not two different things. They are one and the same. We don't serve in order to evangelize loving people, taking care of people, meeting people's needs. That is evangelism. That is evangelism itself. So right after describing the ministry of Jesus, teaching and healing, the Bible says, and this is where our Gospel reading picked up this morning, the Bible says, Then Jesus summoned his twelve disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to cure every disease and every sickness. And he told them, As you go, proclaim the good news. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Cure the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons. In other words, Jesus is sending out the disciples to do exactly what he had been doing. And so when people ask the disciples, what's this kingdom of God that you're talking about? You say the kingdom of heaven has come near. What does that mean? And the disciples can respond, here, you can see it for yourself. The kingdom of God is love and service, healing and freedom, forgiveness and fellowship. That's why Jesus instructs the disciples to cure the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons, and he goes on to say, freely you have received, so freely give. You see, everything you have, your life, your health, your wealth, your energy, your talents, all of those things are gifts from God, right? Right? They are free gifts from God. So, who are you to withhold those gifts from anyone else, right? Jesus says, freely you have received, so freely give. And here is where we finally get to these specific instructions, and this is really, honestly one of my favorite passages in the New Testament, because it's so surprising, and so subversive, and so counter to our expectations. Jesus sends out the disciples two by two, and he sends them with nothing, absolutely nothing. He says, take no gold or silver or copper in your belts, no bag for your journey, or two tunics, or sandals, or a staff. So what's he saying? Don't bring any money. Don't even bring a wallet, right? Don't bring a suitcase. Don't bring a change of clothes. Don't even bring shoes. Now, some people will read this as saying, don't bring an extra pair of shoes. But that's not what I'm seeing here. 
You see, because even at this time, it was not uncommon for wandering preachers and philosophers to intentionally go barefoot. And I think that's what Jesus is instructing here. He's sending the disciples on their journey with no shoes. What do you suppose that means? Why? What's the significance of sending out these barefoot disciples? To go without shoes is a symbol of your own vulnerability and your dependence. It's a sign that you are coming to this town with nothing. You are declaring yourself uh, a beggar. Here are two people coming to your town with nothing, vulnerable. In essence saying, we are at your mercy. And the instruction not to carry a staff carries much the same meaning. You see, because we might think of the staff as simply a, a walking aid, but the staff is an essential tool, and its primary function is self-defense from robbers or wild animals. So for someone to come into town, for someone to go from place to place without even a staff, is again highlighting their own vulnerability. No wonder then uh, Jesus says to them right after this, See, I am sending you out like sheep among wolves. Right? What does it mean to be a sheep among wolves? But these disciples are sent out as homeless, defenseless beggars. Right? You get the picture. And isn't this exactly the opposite of what you would expect. When we think of mission, if I say we're going on a mission trip to the third world, what are we going to do? Well, we're going to bring, we're going to bring resources, because that's the one thing that we have that they don't have, right? So we bring money, we bring food, we bring water, we go there to build a new church building or a school or something. We go and give something away and we come back feeling good about ourselves and grateful for what we have, right? But I think this passage challenges us to change our paradigm of what mission is, because the call of Jesus is not to go and give something. The first missionaries are sent explicitly with nothing. So the paradigm that Jesus is giving us is that mission is not about going and giving something but to go and give ourselves. That's why the disciples are sent out with nothing, because true evangelism is not a one-way street. True, true evangelism is not about what I can give you. True evangelism is about entering into community, about truly creating fellowship and family, right? That's what we discussed last week, that to be baptized is to, to evangelize, is to bring people into family. So we can't just go and give gifts, but we have to give ourselves. We have to create fellowship and family. True evangelism requires a give and take relationship. So I can't help but think of that famous passage, I'm sure many of you know this, from Ministry of Healing, page 143, Christ's method alone will give true success in reaching the people. The Savior mingled with men as one who desired their good. He showed his sympathy for them, ministered to their needs, and won their confidence. Then he bade them, follow me. There is need of coming close to the people by personal effort. If less time were given to sermonizing and more time were spent in personal ministry, greater results would be seen. The poor are to be relieved, the sick cared for, the sorrowing and the bereaved comforted, and the ignorant instructed. We are to weep with those who weep and rejoice with those that rejoice. This is exactly what we see on display here in Matthew chapter 10. Jesus sends out his disciples to mingle with the people to enter into a relationship with people desiring their good, not as a ploy, not as a gimmick, but out of genuine compassion. And when he sends them out, he sends them with nothing because they are not to be giving gifts, but to be giving themselves. 
That, after all, is the true goal of outreach and evangelism. The first and primary task of our mission is to make people into members of God's family. So it's not to dispense material goods. It's not even to dispense information, right? It's a very common temptation for us. I admit, a very common temptation for me as a, a, a student, a teacher, I enjoy educating people. Right? I enjoy teaching people, learning with people. But true evangelism has to go beyond that. Evangelism is not about dispensing goods, it's not about dispensing information, but it's about creating a community of mutual self-giving. You see, so when the disciples go with nothing, someone has to open their doors to them. They are making themselves dependent on the generosity of others, so that what is created there is this fellowship, what the New Testament in Greek calls koinonia, is give and take. Right? So as we go out into the world to evangelize, on a big scale, some evangelistic series, or even in the time that we spend with our friends, our family, our neighbors, we have a responsibility to evangelize. The word evangelize means to, to tell the, the good news. But when you do that, please be humble. Please be compassionate. Don't treat people and their concerns as a means to an end. Don't consider yourself better than others. You see, that's our human nature. And our human nature really loves to cling to this last part uh, of the reading this morning, where Jesus says, if anyone will not welcome you or listen to your words, shake off the dust from your feet as you leave the house or town. Truly, I tell you, it will be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah on the day of judgment than for that time. See, we like this part of the message because we think this is where Jesus is telling us that we are right and everyone else is wrong, and that at the end of the day, anyone who doesn't accept us and our message will get their due. But the point of this passage, the point of these words of Jesus are just the opposite of that. Jesus is saying that judgment will come to those who are inhospitable. Judgment will come to those who do not open their doors and invite in the needy. Those who are unconcerned with the needs of others are the recipients of God's wrath. Those who are unconcerned with the needs of others. And this is the point. You know, Jesus invokes Sodom and Gomorrah. Why? Because the Bible says that the sin of Sodom, this is Ezekiel 16, 49, this was the guilt of your sister Sodom. She and her daughters had pride, excess of food, and prosperous ease, but did not aid the poor and the needy. That's what the Bible says is why Sodom and Gomorrah are destroyed, for a lack of hospitality. So this warning of Jesus at the end of these instructions is not we're right and they're wrong, but it's that judgment comes on anyone who does not open their doors. The disciples are sent out two by two, just like the two angels sent to Sodom and Gomorrah. And the fate of the community is determined by how it treats these defenseless, homeless beggars. And Jesus says to these disciples, whoever accepts you accepts me, but whoever rejects you rejects me and the one who sent me. You see, so that's why it's worse for towns that reject the generosity to these poor, defenseless beggars. Because in rejecting the poor, we are not just rejecting the poor, and we are not just rejecting angels, but Jesus is saying when we reject them, we are rejecting God himself. This is why we have to flip our paradigm. We can't go out and feed the homeless with a condescending attitude, as if we are the saviors helping these 
poor, worthless sinners. No, to evangelize like Jesus, to have a ministry like Jesus, rooted in compassion, is to realize that when we serve the poor, we are not Jesus in that picture. When we serve the poor, we are serving Jesus. Right? Does that make sense? That's why Jesus says, whatever you have done for the least of these, you've done for me. So that's why I uh, draw your attention once more. I told you this was coming again. Now it's green. Uh, and there are extras in the back, or there should be. Uh, but this, this little form is in each one of your bulletins, a volunteer opportunity sheet. Uh, and we're going to keep pushing this. Uh, because I'll tell you, for the amount of people in this room, uh, and the percentage of these forms that we got back is, well, you know, it's disappointing. So we're going to keep doing this. Because this is our responsibility. So fill out your name, your contact information, and check one of these boxes. If nothing comes up of like, well, uh, I don't know if I have time for these things or if these things fit in my schedule, you still fill out the form. And then you check the other box. And then we'll follow up with you, okay? Now the last thing I want to say is that this church has done, I think, an amazing job with giving. This is a very generous church. There's no question about that. But when I look at today's Gospel reading, what I am reminded of is that we have to do more than give gifts. We have to give more than write a check, because that's the easy thing to do. Someone asks you to volunteer and you say, well, I can't do that, but I'll write you a check. True ministry has to go beyond that. Okay? So this church, that is my, that's my goal, that's my vision for the future of this church, is that we are very generous, but we have to move beyond simply giving gifts and move to the point where we are giving ourselves. And so that's what this campaign is about, and it's going to continue as long as it needs to for this church to get on our feet, get out of the pews, and go and serve. So I invite you to pray with me. Father God, we thank you so much for the gift of your Son, who we encounter here in our fellowship, but most importantly, we encounter him out there. So give us eyes to see, give us a heart to will what you will. Father God, please bless us, bless this community, inspire and equip us for your service, we pray through Jesus Christ. Amen. I invite you to stand with me as we sing our closing hymn, I'll Go Where You Want Me To Go, hymn number five. Seven.
we are justified by faith. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have obtained access to this grace in which we stand. And we boast in our hope of sharing the glory of God. And not only that, but we also boast in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not disappoint us, because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that has been given to us. You may be seated.